Well, good evening. Thank you so much for joining us here at today's webinar, Financial Aid Payments and Housing, Navigating a Successful First Year at Western. We appreciate you joining us and we want to welcome you to Western and we're really excited to have you not only join us today, but to be joining us here on campus in the fall. I speak for myself and many of the other presenters tonight that we are Western alumni, so we have been through this process before. Might have looked a little bit different depending on how long ago we attended school, but we've all been through this process, so we understand where you are coming from. My name is Vale Bates. I'm the Office Support Supervisor for the Financial Aid Office, and I hire and train student employees, and I'm also kind of and overseeing our main financial aid lobby. So I'm speaking with you folks each and every day to help you navigate this process as well. And I'll be assisting us in moving through this presentation. A few quick reminders, we are recording today's webinar. So if you have to jet out, you're not able to stay or something happens, um, you can always listen to this webinar later on. These will be made available on several websites and we will send those details out later on. We also have recordings of our webinars available from last year as well. It's very similar information. Um, so you can listen in on any of these. So as far as today's events go, we will begin with some short presentations from our financial aid office, the student business office, and university residences. And after each presentation, we will open it up for a detailed time of Q&A. We do want to keep the focus today's questions on mostly financial related questions about attending Western. A lot of different offices across campus will be offering other webinars or information sessions specific to other services that they provide. So the focus to today is really around those financial related questions. Western will be commuting with communicating with your student via their official Western email. So we just really want to emphasize that any communication related to not only payments, housing, billing, financial aid is all going to come through that Western email. So make sure that you're checking that, especially as we're getting closer to the fall season. Lots of communication is going to start coming your way. And there's a lot of information about other events and campus things that will be happening in the coming weeks as well. We will also probably refer to other departmental websites or other offices on campus that may be helpful as we're going through our webinar. When you do have questions, use the Q&A feature. However, I do recommend holding off because you might have your questions answered during our short presentation. So if you wanna hang on just a little bit, you can pop those questions in the Q&A feature once you have heard the presentation and are sure that we haven't already answered your questions. And then depending on the type of question, we may answer it verbally or we may respond to you directly in chat. And we do kind of ask that you keep your questions specific to maybe general situations or things that other questions other folks might have. If it's a very specific, unique situation, we would be happy to speak with you, but that might be something better served in a call, phone call, email, stop to our office, um, and we also offer appointments as well. So definitely, if there's unique situations that you don't get answered today, that's why we're here. Um, we don't anticipate we're going to be able to answer 400 people's worth of questions tonight. Uh, we'll try to get to as many as we can, though. So Without any further ado, I will turn it over to my financial aid colleague to start our presentation. Good evening, everybody. My name is Molly Patterson. I use she, her pronouns, and I am Assistant Director of Financial Aid here at Western and very happy to see uh, so many attendees. I will share my screen here in a moment, um, and we will talk a brief or give a brief overview about financial aid and how to interpret your financial aid offer. All right, hopefully that's visible to everybody. And uh, I will I will get started here. Um, hopefully this is a familiar site to you. If it's not a familiar site, you may need to get in touch with the financial aid office here at Western so uh, we can get you a financial aid offer. Incoming students receive this paper financial aid offer in the mail, and it yours may look similar to this, uh, although everybody's is a little bit different. So the, the letter comes to you once uh, in paper form, and anything else after that will be done electronically, including any returning years uh, that you attend Western. So this is kind of a, a one-time deal with a nice, pretty layout. Everything else is going to be contained in web for you. 
which you can access with your universal login students and find if information you need there about your financial aid offer, as well as maybe any outstanding requirements that you may have left to fulfill for financial aid purposes. So every year um, you'll get a financial aid offer, uh, presumably because you filed a FAFSA. So you do have to file a FAFSA every year. Uh, if you haven't, again, if you have not seen this sort of financial aid offer, you haven't received an email with your with a link to web for you for your financial aid offer, please get in touch with our office. It likely means that there is something that you need to turn in or otherwise satisfy before we can make an offer to you. Uh, and on that note, uh, doing your FAFSA every year is going to be important so you can get this financial aid offer uh, every year. The 2024 to 2025 FAFSA will be opening in December of 2023. All right, we're going to start with cost of attendance. and talk about what that means. So a cost of attendance is sometimes referred to as a budget. Uh, it is what we anticipate, this is something that we create based on anticipated expenses. And that includes some direct costs as well as indirect costs. Again, the figures here, it's gonna be different if you're a an out-of-state student or an in-state student. So the figures that we are using here are for in-state students. We estimate tuition fees on a, we, we're going to provide this on an annual basis for you, but this covers three quarters worth. Um, and you're only billed for tuition and housing though on a quarterly basis. But these are the direct costs. If you're going to live on campus, that's a direct cost. Tuition and fees are a direct cost. And then we have indirect costs. So those things that you need to live and, uh, you know, be able to go to school, books and supplies, uh, this personal money, maybe something like going to the movies, shampoo money, just miscellaneous items, and transportation. So those are indirect costings that are maybe not billed by Western to you, but they are allowances for which you can have financial aid. So that transportation figure, for example, is based on uh, maybe bringing like a car and maybe some average transportation costs. Uh, but I will let you know that included in your tuition and fees is a bus pass to get around Whatcom County and even pretty efficiently and affordably all the way back uh, down to Seattle if needed um, using some public transportation in the region. That's because your co covers cost of attendance, but let's look at an, a financial aid offer. So this uh, financial aid offer is something that we picked as an example uh, that covers, it has a lot of different types of financial aid that we'll go over. So everyone is different, right? And that is because of the information that's on the FAFSA and a little number that the FAFSA pops out at the end that, that indicates your aid eligibility. Right now that's called the expected family contribution for this, for this coming year. And so that indicates what kind of financial aid you may have. So again, this pretty letter is going to just come once. Hopefully you've already received it and um, everything will else will be done through web for you. So this person has grants in their uh, financial aid offer. It also looks like they have a, a scholarship and some work study and some direct loans. So grants are granted to you as a student based on financial need. Uh, which is inform de uh, determined by the information provided on the FAFSA. Um, so those grants are granted to you. Scholarships are usually based on some uh, information that you provide about yourself and given to you based on merit or other qualities. A work study is a way to earn financial aid, maybe instead of borrowing um, by working on or even off campus. And loans are uh, the ones that are offered here are federal subsidized, uh, federal direct loans. This person has a subsidized loan, which does not accrue interest while the student is in school and an unsubsidized loan. The amounts you see here are typical for the student loan portions for first year students. And those are capped annually by the Department of Education. And there's also lifetime limits to consider. So we have uh, scholarships in here that I see, this one I see, okay, this is from Western. 
And if you are bringing in any outside scholarships, maybe from your local community or from your high school, please do let the scholarship center know. We have main offices in our department. We have financial aid office or the financial aid department. We have our main financial aid services office. We have our student employment center and we have our scholarship center. So please let the scholarship center know that you have money coming from outside because it's much easier and faster to um, process it once that money arrives. Uh, I do also want to touch on work study and working. Um, and I'm going to go back a slide. If you can note the amount of work study that this person has, it's about $6,000 of earnings potential. That's working probably 12 to 15 hours a week, somewhere in that range, depending on your hourly rate. And over here, um, in those indirect costs, we do see that uh, those estimated indirect costs, those transportation, books, pizza money, those sorts of things, uh, those are estimated at about $5,700 or so annual. Notice that work study can cover those indirect costs. So that's just something that to consider um, working while you're in school part time, not full time, definitely, is something that can really assist you in. Um, making school a little bit more affordable. So what do you do when there is a gap between that cost of attendance that we covered first and your total financial aid offer? Uh, this person, they have just under $5,000 difference between what they were offered from financial aid and what we estimate for all of their costs to be a student. Uh, so there are options that you can pursue. One might be a parent plus loan. So this is the federal direct parent plus loan option. So parents, if uh, you have, if the student has reported your information on their FAFSA, you can apply for a plus loan at studentaid.gov. There is a credit check that goes along with that. Uh, students and parents may also look into private educational loans. Again, we do have information on our financial aid website about the private lending, uh, private lenders that um, you can explore. And again, credit check will be required for those lenders. Uh, we did touch on the scholarship piece. Definitely keep applying for scholarships and you can search for scholarships on the Scholarship Center website. It's listed here and you can find it by a quick Google search as well. And um, it lists both Western opportunities as well as some non-Western opportunities. Employment we've touched on, working part-time on or off campus can really help you meet some of your costs and maybe even potentially keep your borrowing needs down as well. You can of course also pay out of pocket for any difference between your financial aid and your costs um, and or from savings. Maybe you're working this summer and you're able to save a little bit to help with some of your costs for the upcoming year. And finally, there is a tuition payment plan that is available uh, for students and families to opt into, and that's available from our partners in the student business office. So this is our last piece here for financial aid. Uh, just keep checking your Western email. Vail did point out that we communicate through your Western email, including letting you know that you have any outstanding requirements for financial aid, um, or if you have a financial aid offer ready to go, that will be visible uh, in web for you. You're going to get an email notification. So keep an eye on your email and checking web for you. All very important. You can view, view your requirements um, if you need to turn anything in by selecting the financial aid tab. To, uh, clicking on your status and selecting the correct uh, aid year, which is like the correct school year, and viewing your student requirements. You can submit required documentation to our office via a secure document uploader. Um, that is our preferred method. And uh, you can also, you also are required to review the terms and conditions of your financial aid offer as well, which uh, this is all contained in web for you. Uh, this financial aid offer that you saw for this person and the one that you received initially, that is based on our anticipated full-time enrollment, and that's considered 12 or more credits. So if there is a quarter in the future where you need to attend less than full-time, do let us know by 
sending us an email, or we have, do have an enrollment revision form you can use. Many types of financial aid are available at less than full-time enrollment, uh, but it is important to let us know because our system defaults uh, to full-time. So uh, finally, in closing, I just want to let you know that we are here for you. We are open Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., and we are uh, able to answer your questions at any any time during those hours. If you have, if you're not sure what we're actually asking you to turn in, if you're not sure if <laughs> everything is ready to go, if you just want to check, please, please give us a call. And also, if there have been a change in circumstances for you or your family, um, some financial changes uh, that you'd like to discuss, also don't hesitate to contact our office. Please reach out, and we'll discuss your options with you. I think that about does it for me. Thank you so much, Molly. That is all really important information. And just a reminder, this is being recorded. So if you weren't taking notes fast enough, you can always rewatch that section of the recording later. Um, and next we will hear from our student business office. Thank you, Vale. Yes, so my name is Holly and I am a fiscal specialist here at the student business office. Let's make sure. I am sharing my screen. Okay, looks good. So let's get started. The, um, as the student business office, we're going to go over when, where, and how to pay your bill. So we're going to start here with just a little introduction to the SBO. So we are located on the first floor of Old Main, right by the Rose Garden. So if you recently took a tour of campus, you probably start stopped right outside of our office. And we are comprised of three different units. So we have the payment unit, and they handle all payments that Western receives. So for students, that would mean payments for your tuition, fees, housing, and other education-related expenses. We also have our billing unit, which I am a part of, um, and we are responsible for the financial activity on your student account. So that includes things like tuition charges, refunds, and your year-end tax statements as well. And then lastly, we have our debt recovery unit also. So um, debt recovery unit helps students navigate the repayment of their federal loans and also assist students with any former student account balances. So if you find yourself leaving Western with a balance, get in touch with the student business office um, because we can certainly assist with repayment solutions uh, through our debt recovery unit. So that is the SBO in short. So let's talk about when, where, and how to pay your bill. So here I have an image of our student business office uh, website. So that's gonna be sbo.ww.edu. This is our home page, but I do have the tuition and payments tab expanded here. So you can see all the links um, that are included under that. And that way um, you can get an idea of all the information that's gonna be available on our webpage. The tuition and fees link is gonna give you some general pricing information on tuition. Uh, definition of fees is gonna go over those mandatory fees that you pay every quarter and how that money is utilized on campus. There's a link here for our payment plan, which Molly did mention briefly. This webpage is updated quarterly with the enrollment dates for the payment plan and we'll go into that into a little more detail later. But we're going to dive right into all the information that's housed under this when, where, and how to pay link. So when is tuition due? Tuition is always due on the first day of classes. So for this upcoming fall quarter, that's going to be September 27th. Something to keep in mind is that you are billed tuition on a quarterly basis based on your registration. So those charges are probably going to show up on your student account way earlier than they're actually due. Some of you might have noticed that you already have fall charges on your student account. Um, if you haven't noticed that yet, don't worry, because some of those aren't being released until the end of August, but you will be seeing those by the end of August. But keep in mind that payment is not actually due until the first day of classes, which is September 27th. A grace period is then always um, extended to the following 15th of the month. So for fall, that would be October 15th. If the fall tuition remains unpaid at the close of business on October 15th, you are gonna be subject to a $55 late fee and a 1% interest charge. 
And those are assessed on a monthly basis. So if that same tuition remains unpaid until November 15th, you'll get another set of those fees. December 15th, same thing. Uh, so the real takeaway here is remember tuition's due first day of classes and late fees are assessed that following 15th of the month. So in addition to having those established due dates and late fee dates, um, we do also send statement notification emails. So here in green on this slide, I've got the email address that those notification emails will come from. So this is a really good one to keep an eye out for in your student inbox, like we've talked about, very important. <laughs> um, but you could also favorite this email address in your um, uh, email app that you use or just keep an eye out because any correspondence coming from this email is going to have to do with your financial account. And the body of this slide here is um, an example of what a body of those notification emails is going to look like. As you can see, it's got a lot of information, super helpful reminders on those due dates, late fee policies, payment options and all that. But it doesn't actually include any student specific information. And that's because it acts more as like a prompt for you to log in to your Western account and review your statements. So we'll get into that in just a second too, um, navigating to your Western account online and finding those statements. Here is an example of what a monthly statement is gonna look like. So it is a two page document. So on the left side of the screen here, I've got the front page of the statement. It's got a date up here in the right hand corner. It'll show your total balance due. The body of the statement has an area for a previous account balance. So if you had a balance left over from your last statement, that's gonna be accounted for here. But then here you'll see that there's gonna be itemized details of all the activity that's happened in the last 30 days. So this example is a July 1st statement. So all this account activity is June account activity. And then again, at the bottom of the statement is just a reiteration of that total balance that's currently due. The second page of the statement is gonna have more of those reminders of payment due dates, uh, late fee timelines and policies, and payment options. So definitely take a look at both of those pages whenever you're reviewing your statements. So I hear you saying, all right, great, where do I find this information? So that's gonna be your Western account online. So let's talk about that. I have another screenshot here of the homepage of our Student Business Office website. Right on the homepage, you'll see this blue box for make a payment. There is a link for students and a link for parents. Both of these links are gonna take us to the Western account online, which looks like this. Students, you already have access to this through your web for you using your universal login information. Parents will dive in in just a second to talk about how to get you your own uh, username and password. But let's talk about this overview page here really quickly. As you can see up in the right hand corner, there is your current account balance. So this is going to be the most up to date information. Let's say on September 1st, you got a statement notification email from us. You logged into your Western account online. You went over here to statements and you downloaded that September 1st statement and saved it. Now it's September 27th, first day of classes and your tuition is due. So you come back into your Western account online, but the balance up here does no longer matches the balance on your September 1st statement. That's likely because there's been new activity within the current month of September. And you can see that activity if you go over here on the left hand side and go to activity details, that's going to take you to a new page where all the activity in the current month resides. So that way you can reconcile between your September 1st statement and the current balance that's due. So students, you can navigate up here to the My Account tab, which is going to take you to this page. And as you can see, there's um, a box highlighted for payer information. And right under that, there's a link to send a payer invitation. So students can go here. They would input the name and email address for anyone that they would want to have their own login and access to this account. And then that person would receive an email with their authorized user login information and instructions on how to log in for the first time and reset your password and everything. 
Once you've done that, you'll have your own unique login to access the Western account online as an authorized payer. You'll be able to see statements, uh, access tax documents, review balances and make payments. And then you'll also be enrolled to receive those statement notification emails as well. So it really is a great thing for students to take care of for anyone else that wants to have that access. Okay, so now you know where to go. Let's talk about how you can pay. I've included here an image directly from our student business office website. So this would be if you navigated to sbo.ww.edu, clicked on that tuition slash payments tab, and then clicked on that when, where, and how to pay link. It would take you right here to this landing tree. And you can see that there's links that will navigate you to detailed information on all these different payment options. So if you have specific questions on re requesting get payments, click this link. It'll take you to all the information that you need. Same with sending a phys physical check, paying in person. So we really like to point, point you in the right direction to find the information. And then of course, we're here to answer any questions you might have as well. I do wanna note for online payments, Wester's preferred method for online payments is um, using an e-check. So that's a safe and secure way to pay through your Western account online, entering in your bank account and routing number, and then the funds are drafted from your bank account and applied to the student account immediately. The great thing about this payment method is that there's no processing fee. So it's a free way to draft those funds from your bank account. If you opted to pay with a card instead, whether that be a credit card or a debit card, um, those charges are subject to a merchant services fee of 2.85%. So if you're able to go the e-check route, we definitely recommend that to avoid those additional processing fees. I'm guessing you 529 pairs out there are noticing that there's a link here for sending 529 payments. So if you were to click that, it would take you to this page of our website. So we've got a ton of information here about the options available to you to pay with your 529 account. So we recommend navigating to this area of our website, taking in all the options, um, getting together with your 529 provider and determining what's gonna make the most sense and what option fits with um, the plan that you have. I will let you know the first option here is always going to work with every 529 provider, and that is a direct payment to you where the provider wires the funds to you directly. And then once they're in your bank account, you make an e-check payment like we had just chatted about. Um, and so that's always a, a fast and safe option to get those funds to Western. Um, as mentioned previously as well, we do offer a payment plan that's available for enrollment on a quarterly basis. Um, there is not an option to enroll in one for the academic year. So keep in mind, you are en enrolling in one of these every quarter. There's gonna be two options that are available. The first option is available for enrollment, usually the first couple weeks of the quarter, and it's gonna split your balance owed into three installments. If you miss the enrollment period for that plan, there's a second plan that opens up a little later, um, but it does split your pay payment owed only into two installments. Regardless of which plan you choose, there's going to be a $35 enrollment fee. And the first installment is going to be due at the time of enrollment. The great thing about this option is you can split your payment up over the quarter and you won't be subject to those $55 late fee and 1% interest charges that we talked about at the beginning. So it's a really good option. And so that kind of really touches on, it's a lot of information I know, so thanks for hanging with me, but that touches on a lot of the important pieces of when, where, and how to pay. So the last things I would like to touch on is the four homework items that we would like every incoming freshman to take care of. Um, and that's our checklist for success. These links are available on the homepage of our student business office website, and I'll just go over them very quickly here. So the first one is our release of financial information form. Our office is subject to federal privacy regulations similar to HIPAA. They're called FERPA, and it restricts us from being able to discuss student financial account information with anyone other than the student. 
unless the student gives us permission to do so. So this form allows a student to give us that permission and it's a very easy electronic signature form. Nothing needs to be printed. Um, so that's a really good way to make sure that students are granting that access for their payers. The authorization to apply financial aid funds is another electronic signature form. Federal financial aid um, can't pay for certain charges unless the student gives permission for that. So this is a form for them to do that. And a very good thing to just get taken care of right away so, so there's no hiccups there. The payer invitation we had already uh, discussed through the Western account online. One note I will just make is recognizing the difference between these two. If you have your um, authorized payer login, you can access the statements, you can make payments um, through the online account, that's awesome. But we're still bound by FERPA um, as far as being able to discuss the account in detail. So we do wanna make sure your student takes care of both of those things. So that way, if you call us with a question, we can talk about it, no problem. Last but not least here is direct deposit. So should you have a refund on your student account, uh, the student business office handles sending those to students and we prefer to do that by direct deposit. There might be a, a handful of reasons why you'd have a refund on your account. Let's say you registered for classes and you paid everything in full, then you dropped a couple classes and that created a refund of that tuition. We need to send those funds back to you. Alternatively, let's say you have you live off campus, but you take out loans and plan to use them to cover your off campus rent. Those loans will come to your student account first. They'll pay for all the charges that might be owed, and then those funds will be sent to you, ideally by a direct deposit. So we partner with a third party called Bank Mobile to be able to send those um, direct deposits to you. I have their website up here, refundselection.com. You can navigate there and follow all the instructions. This is the image of the homepage that you'll see go through this process and then you can enroll in direct deposit. I do want to note, you do not have to sign up with any bank mobile products to be able to do this. You can use your existing bank account information. You'll simply be inputting that here at this website. And then that way the refund will be sent to you through bank mobile to your existing bank account. If you don't take any action on this, the funds would eventually be sent to you as a paper check to your address on file with Western, but that can take up to 21 days. So definitely faster and a little safer to um, send that to you by direct deposit. And that is all the information that I currently have. Again, I know that was a lot, so I look forward to answering any of the lingering questions you might have. And I appreciate your time and I'll send it back to Vale. Thank you so much, Holly. That was very thorough and um, complete. And I will just mention really quickly that our office does have a separate release of information. So um, just because we want to make it complicated, um, each office may have individual forms. So if you would like to discuss billing, but also financial aid, you'll need to, your student will need to complete with, with each office. So um, yeah, just to be thorough. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for all of that information. That was great. And um, last but definitely not least, we're going to hear from our team at University Residences about all billing and financial related questions over in our housing. Take it away, Dong. Hello, everybody. I will share my screen here. Um, my name is Dong Vo. I'm an assistant director with Residence Life under University Residences. That's a fancy way of saying housing. Um, but our uh, department also includes other things such as uh, facilities, housing assignments, billing, um, conference services, dining, and whatnot as well under the, the umbrella of university residences. Today, I do have a colleague who will be co-presenting with me. I'll have Michelle introduce herself real quickly. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Michelle Clark, and I also work in university residences as a fiscal specialist in our housing business office. And I'll join in a little later after Don gives us some more important information regarding um, all of our financial um, information we adhere to, um, like the student business office with um, payments. Great. Um, so we have a snapshot here of our main website um, where you'll find most of your answers or answers to your questions. I'll kind of walk you through the overall website and kind of talk about each section. Um, certainly, 
you should, there are four main sections um, that are highlighted here for parents and families, future students, current residents, and our guide to housing. Um, I do recommend that you spend time thumbing through each section. Um, the first section, parents and families, we have information about move-in dates, um, when to move in, if you have questions about how to send mail, how to receive mail, when you can start sending packages, other financial information about different room types that we have, so the different room types that are available on campus, whether they're apartment style, suite style, doubles, triples, um, or whatnot, we'll have a different um, room rate, um, as well as different types of meal plans available for you to um, browse. Um, Michelle will go over some of that information in more detail later, um, and then the different types of services that are generally available. If you're a future student, that button is for you to apply for housing. Additional information on how to find roommates and different dining options. Maybe you need dining accommodations, things like that as well. Current residents are uh, obviously for current students who live on campus. I still highly recommend that you spend um, time on that section. Um, it goes over all the different halls that we have. So if you wanna spend more time to dig into the different communities and what each community uh, amenities are, what their staff um, looks like or what kind of staffing is available for each building, um, it'll also go over uh, different ways to get support, maintenance requests, things like that. Um, so there are a lot of different resources under that one tab. So just because you've moved in and um, you live on campus, that's still a very valuable tab, especially if there's any questions or issues. We also post um, any available housing jobs uh, under that tab, as well as the student employment website. The last uh, button, the guide to housing, um, goes over all of the important things that you might wanna know as you get closer and closer to September, particularly with how do I pack? What are things that I might wanna bring? Um, it'll go over different information um, on what we would recommend you bring. Um, do you need uh, insurance, uh, for, for example? Um, so I do want to just highlight that, again, take all the time to go through all, all of those different sections. But if you do get confused or you need um, some more one-on-one -on -one support, uh, we are here for you. Our contact information is at the bottom. You can email us or you can call us directly. Um, during normal business hours. Um, but I, I do want to highlight again some of the differences that are available and there are different room rates. Um, so there are um, our most common room type are doubles. And so that's two people sharing a, a bedroom or triples, which is three people. We do have different a variety of different suite types. So some suites have a a separate restroom or a separate living room. And then we do have some um, apartment style that is um, mainly restricted to upperclassmen called Burnham Wood. Again, you can look under the current residence section to see all the different rooms and buildings that we have. Um, please also keep an eye out um, as you um, move on to campus. I highly recommend that you get involved um, in your hall. There are different leadership opportunities. So if you were involved in high school or community college or any other um, academic setting where you're just really involved, want to plan fun events. Um, there is something called a residential programming board that'll give you a lot of um, leadership experience, especially if you're looking to um, apply for jobs on campus. Um, but housing in particular, we employ about 100 resident advisors each year, and that job search begins uh, around October and um, concludes in early spring where that position comes with a small salary and room and board is included. So it is quite an attractive uh, position if you are looking for some uh, added financial support there. Um, in addition, uh, before I hand it over to Michelle, each community will, uh, will have its own front desk and that's where you can go for service. Um, during the day and um, until 9 p.m. daily. You can get additional supplies there. There are general cleaning supplies. We also provide um, toilet paper. You can check out uh, cooking equipment, uh, board games, and things like that as well. Um, so you don't need to worry about toilet paper or buying any uh, major cleaning supplies unless you have something in particular. 
Our residence hall also provide free lockouts and 24-7 um, sec um, security. And so um, if you ever need assistance or emergency response, we do have emergency responders on our campus, as well as every single night, um, our staff will do rounds to secure the building and are available for any situation, whether it's an emergency um, or there's a rowdy neighbor or a, a roommate conflict or any number of other issue, uh, issues that might arise from living on campus. Um, your room and board also includes utilities, internet, and maintenance. Um, for um, as you need as well. So you can always uh, file for maintenance and you can expect to have high-speed internet and utilities included. Um, at this point, I'll pass it to Michelle to share a little bit more about room and board and more financial information. Okay, hello everybody. Um, so yes, regarding our financial, um, our payments, um, we basically hear, adhere to all of the um, dates and deadlines from the student business office. So um, you have one student account, so your tuition, your room and board payments, those will all go on one student account. So those are due quarterly. And um, we make sure that we work really closely with the student business office and financially um, just to make sure that, you know, we're talking with them if we have anything past like deadline. So like um, Holly was um, talking about the 15th, if there's, if you haven't paid your student account for uh, room and board um, on the 15th, those late fees will go on. And then on the 16th, you might get an email from our department letting you know to make contact with our office um, regarding payment. Um, um, your Western student account, also everything that's put in first, actually the payments go and pay whatever's on your student account first. So sometimes um, when your tuition's on your student account first, um, since housing's charges will not be on and probably until about the second week of September, normally um, payments will go in and pay those charges first. So that's why sometimes you'll see housing, your room board charges will be the last to be paid. So again, if you do have questions um, and know that you have like outstanding requirements from financial aid and it's around the 16th, you're getting that email from us, just make sure you're following through and reading that email really closely and getting back with our office. Um, we're here to help you um, navigate anything regarding anything delinquent. Um, also um, collaboratively work with all the other departments um, to help um, regarding financial aid, student business office, so we can um, help you with anything that you might need um, additional help with regarding outstanding requirements um, or you know anything that comes from like a 529 account that might be coming in late that you thought may have paid. Um, and then we also just want to let you know um, with housing, it's really important um, to know, and I know Dong talked about this with our tiered billing. If for some reason, say you're two weeks into the quarter and you decide you would like to switch resident halls, you may go into a different kind of um, tiered billing, which it may be less or it may be more, but just make sure that um, when you change rooms within a week time, you wanna make sure you're checking into your student account to see if there's any adjustments that you may need to have to pay before the 15th to avoid those late fees and interest that might go on that account. Um, this also may happen with meal plan changes. Um, our meal plan change link will be up um, in your housing portal if you're going to be living with us um, by September 4th. So if you need to change your meal plan, say you, you came in and you decided you wanted to be on the unlimited meal plan and all of a sudden you're like, wait, that's way too many meals and I don't want that many meals. Um, you can adjust that um, the first two weeks of the quarter. So the second week, second Friday of the quarter, you have that chance to decrease your meal plan. And then you always have the um, choice to increase your meal plan at any time. Um, if you have any questions, um, be more than happy to answer any of those at the business office. Um, our number is a little different from what is up here. Our housing main hub um, goes into our occupancy office. So if you do have questions regarding meal plan um, prices, changes, you can call the housing business office. Um, um, and our number just differs. Um, for, it's like 360-650-3744. And I'd be more than happy to help you um, with any questions you have that will directly come to me. Um, and then we also um, just wanna make sure that um, you all know that you're very supported with our office also. We're open Monday through Friday, eight to five. Um, we always have people that are there to help you um, with any roommate issues you have, building requests or concerns. Um, if you need to come in and stop and see us, 
um, or if you have any billing issues or need to um, have us look over your uh, business, you know, your account, your Western student account online, we'd be more than happy to go over any of those also for you. Um, and then just also remember any of your meal plan changes that you do um, actually do once the um, portal comes up and you're able to change your meal plan, the adjustment to your account for that meal plan, either decreasing or increasing, actually happens the following business day. So don't be alerted if you change your meal plan and you go right into your student account and all of a sudden you're like, why isn't my charge there? I increased my meal plan. That actually will happen the following business day. And just make sure you're also, if you're changing any meal plans during mid-quarter, you're also following the guidelines from the student business office that you're paying any of those charges um, before the 15th of the following month to avoid late fees and interest. Um, I'm going to hand that back to you, Dong. Thanks, Michelle. Um, I will uh, end by saying one more thing is that I, if you have the opportunity um, or you live nearby, um, that I highly recommend um, you pack less than you think you need um, because you can always go back to get additional things. But that housing guide will really tell you what are the things that we recommend. If you have a roommate already, um, I do highly recommend that you spend time talking with the roommate to determine who's going to bring what. Um, who's going to bring the microwave and, and things like that. One additional thing that I'll post in the chat for everybody at this moment is something called the Resident Checkout Program. Um, every single year, we try to reclaim any refrigerators, microwaves, any number of things that students might try to throw out. And then we check to make sure that it's in working condition and we check it out to students for free. This program can save you quite a bit of money, and um, part of our sustainable practices is not to see a pile up of uh, refrigerators at the end of the year or anything like that. Residents are welcome to check it out, um, free of charge again, and um, if they really like to keep it, they can keep it as well, free of charge as well. So it is a very popular program and something that you do want to keep an eye out at the start of the year. Um, and please, again, a reminder. Um, you can feel free to reach out to us or call us if you have any questions. And thank you. Thank you so much, Dong. Wow, that was a lot of information. I'm sure you guys have a lot of questions and I've seen quite a few already answered in the chat, but um, we are ready to move on to the Q&A feature of this webinar. Um, so go ahead and throw your questions in the chat if you haven't already, or if you didn't get an answer to your previously considered questions. And again, we may answer them in the chat, especially if it includes phone number, email, something to that effect, or we may answer them out loud. So just keep an eye on the chat there. And uh, let's get going with our questions. What do we have first? Okay, um, I'm going to bat this one to financial aid. Some of these questions were from early on, and I actually found about five different questions related to work study and um, jobs. And so I'm going to sort of synthesize in that uh, re maybe reiterate where students can access and find jobs, both work study and non-work study, and maybe a little bit about the difference between work study and a regular non-work study job. And then there was a couple of questions about how students got paid. I think that there are sometimes when um, the question is, is that work study job going to be used to pay towards tuition? So if you could answer those, Molly, um, in the financial aid realm about work study and employment, and that'll clear a few questions here. Sure thing. Okay, I'm going to start with work study. I probably should have explained a little bit more when we were uh, during the presentation. Um, so work study uh, is, I think I did say this, it is a way to earn financial aid. And I'm going to try to get a, a website up for you because I think there was a question, uh, not only just what is what is work study or um, what happens if I don't have work study? Can I still work? So let me get some information up here for us. Just a moment. But essentially, um, work study is uh, essentially earning your financial aid. Like it's a piece of financial aid. You saw it in that uh, example financial aid offer. And it uh, allows you to, you know, uh, find a job on campus that is work study eligible. So I will... I'm going to pull this up here just a moment. I think it will be a little bit more clear. Um, okay.
All right. You can see that hopefully. Uh, so uh, this is our Student Employment Center website. And on here is where you can find jobs uh, for uh, students of Western here on campus. You can find non-work study jobs. So if you don't, if you look at your financial aid offer, either on that paper or in web for you, and you don't see work study offer, don't fret. You can still work on campus. And those would be non-work study jobs, just any uh, employment opportunity that you have uh, or that we have at Western that's just not funded by work study. Um, so you can find uh, on-campus jobs. We also allow employers to advertise for off-campus jobs. And I'll just kind of click on this so you get an example. You do have to be a Western um, authenticated user in order to access this. So students, you're going to have to pull this up. And uh, you can see that we have, I think I did write this down somewhere. We have 40, I think, jobs in, um, in this area right now. And then in the work study section right now, um, like, there are some off-campus opportunities, but for on-campus, I think we have 30 or something like that that I had counted earlier. Uh, so basically, um, it is not the only way to work on campus via work study, right? You can also do the non-work study. Uh, so work study is just a, a piece of financial aid. Essentially, you're earning your financial aid instead of maybe borrowing um, or in addition to borrowing. Um, it has some other benefits, which uh, can, can come along with it, but it uh, in terms of certain types of work study can be excluded from future FAFSA income consideration. Uh, but essentially working on campus, like the message that I want to get across is that working part-time as a student can really, really help you with affordability. And then Dina, what was your other? Um, I think it, some of it was, there was a question of sort of how people get paid. Okay, yeah. Um, in terms of paychecks versus paying towards tuition. Okay, so say you have work study, um, or I mean, in or not, either way, you do have to go find your own position. That's why we have these listings, right? So no matter how you get paid, whether it's that you're working in a work study job because you have a financial aid offer that includes work study, or you're working in a non-work study position on or off camp, uh, on campus, if you're going to work on campus, um, Western is going to provide you a paycheck. And it's it's the same process as whether you have work study and you're working on campus or you do not have work study and you're working on campus. Same process. You have to fill out a time card, submit your hours, um, and you will get paid that way. So it doesn't matter how that like funding comes through, whether it's maybe a department on campus is paying for you instead of the, the piece of financial aid that's that's paying you to work. Okay. We also, there was, uh, I think, a final question here about, I can't find it now, but uh, do we recommend that students work part-time while going to school? Oh, we do recommend that for sure. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. Um, so some studies have shown that students who work uh, part-time while attending school um, are more academically successful uh, and uh, not really sure why, but there's a correlation there. Uh, so we do recommend that students work part-time, not full-time. And we do put a cap on the amount of hours that students um, can work at Western. And that is 19 hours per week. And if you're in the non-work study section, looking at off-campus jobs, um, so this is just saying, you know, that this is another employer. So say uh, there's a job posted by a local business uh, for, for part-time work. They cannot post um, more than 19 hours per week in the job requirements. So we do live that because we understand that your first job is to be a student. And so we wanna make sure that you're not spending the majority of your time working at a different job. Okay. And then I'm gonna clarify, hopefully there's a lot of questions about work study, which is fabulous. We love um, parent and student interest in working. Um, I wanna clarify, because there are still questions, um, whether it's a work study job or a regular on-campus non-work study job, all jobs on campus result in a paycheck. Yes. It is not applied directly to any account balance. So no matter what, students will be receiving a paycheck in most cases that is direct deposit to their bank account, just as employees like us have. Um, and then students can use those proceeds from their paycheck to pay for either expenses on their student account 
or pay for some of those personal expenses or whatever that has. But it is never directly applied to any account balance. It is paid to students in the form of a paycheck. So I just want to clarify that. I think we're going to move on to um, a business office question, if I can get back and find that amidst all the work study questions. Um, there is a question from the business office regarding the payer invitations. Um, so this question is, can students request multiple payer invitations to family members? So they might have a couple different family members that want to be supporting those expenses. Yes, you absolutely can. And um, students can add and remove multiple payers if um, someone put in an email address and then decided they wanted it to go to a different email address, the student can remove that payer and re-add it. So there's a lot of options there, but yes, you can definitely send payer invitations to multiple, um, to multiple payers, multiple family members. Right. Thank you. And I'm going to actually uh, hit you up again, Holly. Um, what date will the payment plan enrollment be for fall quarter? Um, so I don't know yes. if that's the opening date, but they they had some questions about that. Yeah. So the first payment plan of the quarter, the three installment payment plan, usually opens up about a week before the quarter starts. So for fall, that would be roughly about uh, September 20th. And then it usually stays open for two weeks. So it's definitely that first week of the quarter is going to be a sweet spot. Um, that payment plan will surely be open at that time. But yeah, I'd say around on or around September 20th was when that first one should be opening up. And those payment, those dates should be posted on our website here soon. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, this is a question, I think Dong started to talk about this, but there is a question about the resident checkout program becoming available to new students that are moving in. Do you have an answer for that? I have a partial answer. Um, it is coordinated by our facilities office. Um, so if you are urgently needing an answer, um, that if you contact our facilities office, um, somebody there might give you a, be able to give you a more specific answer. At this time, I do know that they just advertise on our social media that it is opening soon, and that was just four days ago. That is, again, called our Residence Hall Reuse Program. Um, again, I posted the link in the chat. Um, you can also follow WW Housing on Instagram or WW Housing Sustainability. If you go on there right now, you'll see a posting that says that you can reserve Residence Hall Living Essentials for free this school year. Um, and it's opening very soon. Okay. Thank you. Okay, um, this one, Molly, we're gonna have a financial aid question. This is about sort of filling that gap. Um, do you recommend doing a federal direct parent plus loan before pursuing a private loan? So I think sort of emphasizing a little bit of the differences or, or maybe choices that families would make with that. Yeah, that's a good question. And I'm going to give the dreaded slash standard financial aid answer, which is it depends. Uh, it does depend on, uh, you know, each family situation, which one may be more favorable. Generally, the Parent PLUS loan will have fewer barriers and uh, it could have a better interest rate uh, during the application process. So I think we did review that Parent PLUS loans do come with a credit check. Um, adverse, credit history, uh, adverse credit history is published on the Department of Education's website. So those are reasons maybe why a PLUS loan would not be approved. Um, you can check for maybe if you feel like you might fall into one of those categories. Um, but if you do pass the credit check, then it's a fixed rate, um, a fixed interest rate. So it is uh, beneficial in that regard. And um, it's that interest rate is offered like without regard to your credit history, whether just whether or not you pass that credit check. On the other hand, we are um, seeing parents applying for private educational loans. And there are companies that do offer loans to parents. And depending on your uh, credit history and um, other factors, they may lend to you uh, at a potentially a more favorable interest rate. I think that the benefits 
uh, for the Parent PLUS loan. Um, you know, even if you were to get something comparable uh, from a private lender, like an offer, you know, with a maybe similar interest rate or maybe a little lower are going to be on the back end. So when it comes to repayment um, of the Parent PLUS loan, there is a little more flexibility. Also, you know, um, yeah, heaven forbid that we enter another pandemic or some other national emergency. But um, if that were to occur, you know, the federal government may put another payment pause on. So there are just a little bit more, you know, there's a little bit more of a safety net there. So um, again, it does depend on each individual family circumstances, um, how, how much you're looking to apply for um, and what you feel like is in your best interest. So if you have a, you know, very great credit history, you may want to explore that private arena, but I would say on the whole, um, when I'm advising families, I would suggest that you do look into the parent plus loan first. Great. Thank you. We are going to go back to the business office. This is sort of a specific question, but I think it's a great one for everybody to hear. Trying to set up my refund choice on bank mobile. I may have missed this info if it was said, but does the school send you a personal code? I tried to enter my email address and school name I, and I got a message saying the code cannot be sent. So they're having some problems navigating that. So go to business office, talk about that. Yeah, you should be able to, um, at that home page, opt uh, to click the need a code button. But if that doesn't work, we can send you a code. So if you're having any issues logging in, call the business office, send us an email. Um, our email is just the sbo at www.edu. And we can send you a personal code right away and just respond to your email and say, hey, you should be good to go now. So definitely don't hesitate to reach out to us with any issues on that for sure. Okay. And this is, is, is probably a collaborative answer between financial aid and the business office because those two offices are very, very closely linked. Um, but so I, I may have you, Holly, just uh, start and see if financial aid needs to get involved. But um, how and when is financial aid awards applied to the tuition? Um, and then there's some sort of questions about can you pick and choose how those funds get applied to your bill. So I want it to go to tuition or I want it to go to this. So maybe you could speak about that. Yeah, generally um, the financial aid is dispersed the Friday before classes start. So I think we kind of phrase it as financial aid begins dispersing that Friday before classes start. So for fall, that's going to be Friday the 22nd. And um, the funds that you've accepted, and Molly, please feel free to jump in if I say anything out of turn. <laughs> um, but the funds that you've accepted will pay out directly to your student account. And Michelle had mentioned earlier that those are just going to pay the oldest charges first. So um, it's technically going to pay towards your tuition and fees first, but it's going to pay towards all the balance that it can on your student account. And then if there happens to be additional funds remaining, that will be sent to you as a refund. And then that's your money to use um, as you choose. So it'll first go to your account, pay for everything that's billed through Western, and then the remaining funds will be sent to you. Or if there's a remaining balance, then you'll be notified of that through one of our statements, and you'll be able to make a payment of whatever's remaining after financial aid. Perfect. I think that that really answers that really well. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go to housing. Um, this particular one is also a, a specific instance, but my student has not been able to get on campus housing at this time, and we are hoping something opens up. If not, how likely is it uh, to get on campus housing for winter quarter? Great question. Um, at this time, um, we do guarantee housing for first year students who applied um, on time. Um, otherwise, um, there is a wait list for fall. Um, if you do have some special circumstance, we do really recommend that you call in um, so that we can discuss. Um, so maybe you have some special accommodations or something like that. Um, we might be able to do something. Um, if you were, if we're not able to provide housing for fall term, um, I can't guarantee anything, but there is a pretty good chance that we will have availability by winter quarter. Um, you can always apply throughout any, at any given time throughout the quarter. So you can apply in the middle of fall or winter or spring. 
Um, but as uh, we don't have a first year live on requirement, people will start to move out over time. And uh, we typically will have vacancies um, by winter and definitely by spring. Great, good news there. Molly, there are a couple questions, and this is again is a clarification of a point you made earlier, but um, somebody is asking about transportation, personal miscellaneous, is that paid to Western or is that assumed per student? So could you just reiterate that again? Sure, yeah. Uh, so those miscellaneous costs that we talked about, transportation, those are indirect costs. So they are, if to use the terminology that was used here, assumed um, or um, what I might call an allowance, essentially, that you could use financial aid to meet, um, but it is not something like Western will not bill you for um, uh, those indirect expenses. So books and supplies. Now, on the other hand, there is an ability to charge your books uh, to your student account. Um, and uh, there is information uh, out there about how to how to even have financial aid cover those. It involves um, completing an e-sign form um, and authorization to apply financial aid funds. But other than that, like you'd have to opt into that, right? But uh, that's a choice. Um, but otherwise, Western will not be billing you for those sorts of those costs. So those are those indirect expenses. Great. I think it's, it's really important. There's a lot of information that is happening um, on this webinar. So I think it's great that we can kind of highlight some points. Um, and then let's see, I had a question for the business office about 529 plans and I have lost it. So I'm gonna actually, there's a couple questions about um, scholarships. And so I'm gonna answer real quick as somebody who works in the scholarship office on campus, um, our freshman out of state student received a scholarship offer from Western, will this amount be automatically applied? And then we are billed the remaining amount or do we need to do anything special to activate the scholarships? Um, in most cases, uh, a lot of uh, admission scholarships or scholarships from the university um, do not have additional requirements. However, we also have some scholarships that were awarded to students and they were told by admissions that um, they would be replaced with a different one. And sometimes those second scholarships do have additional requirements. Either way, the um, letter from the scholarship um, administrator in admissions detailing the scholarship should give you good information. And I also know that they have um, the admissions office has a great portal, which has some um, information so you can be checking on the progress of scholarships. Um, but to answer that first piece is those scholarships, if they're ready, everything is done, those get automatically applied on a quarterly basis to the tuition bill, much like financial aid, loans, scholarships, everything is sort of um, added to that student account and, and pays towards the outstanding balance. Um, and then I'm going to go to housing, and there is a question about um, what's the link to schedule your move-in day? So that may have been an older one. I just want to make sure and get that question answered. Great. Um, I don't have that information on hand. I'm, I do recommend really checking your email because it should open in the coming weeks. Um, really what you want to um, pay attention to is housing has some webinars as well. Um, and in those webinars, we will have people um, there that will be discussing the um, move-in logistics, um, so specifically related to move-in. And that the webinar schedule is right on the main housing webpage. And we have several um, webinars scheduled um, there as well, which is August 18th and September 6th. Um, but in short, you will get a, an email and link to sign up for a date and time to check in uh, for move-in. Thank you. I found my student business office question. So Holly, you're on. Um, are there fees associated with any of the 529 payment options? Yes, yeah, so I can speak to one of them, and I'm actually going to pull them up here to make sure that I'm giving you the detailed information. So one of the payment options is through the Western Account Online Portal. So if you're 529 plan partners with Transact, that's the company that oversees our payment portal. 
you can pay directly through that payment portal, but that is going to have a $10 processing fee associated with it. The other options are more going to be determined by your 529 plan, whether there is uh, a fee. Having the funds sent to you directly, you'll have to check with your 529 provider if they charge a fee for anything like that. Flywire is going to be a direct payment from your 529 plan to Western, so the fee would also be determined by your 529 plan, but I can definitely let you know the $10 fee for the payment through Transact. Thank you. Um, let's see. Yeah, so interesting. And, and I don't know if anybody knows this one. Um, when my daughter opens the Web for You website, it appears to be an outdated version of it. What would the new version of it look like? I don't know that we can show that, but I do know there's some some changes that have happened and kind of feels like it's a little bit of both. I think some of our screens sort of start in a new modality and then depending on what links you might click, and I know financial aid is one of them that does go back to sort of an older version. Um, we're not fully upgraded yet. So does anything, anybody else have anything to add to that? Or is that pretty overall kind of what we think about web for you? I think we're good there. Okay. Um, and then I'm gonna go back to, to Molly. I received an, an accepted an unsubsidized loan. Can I cancel this loan if since I've now decided to self-pay? Yes. <laughs> sure, it's the same to answer. Um, yeah, if you previously accepted a direct loan, um, then uh, at this point, since it's not paid out, uh, it is very easy to request a cancellation. You do have to make that request in writing to our office um, via your Western email is an easy way to do that. We also have a form you can fill out and either bring in, use a document uploader or submit from uh, email address, uh, preferably your Western email address if it's signed. But essentially at this point, very easy to cancel uh, a loan and reverse your decision by notifying our office from your Western email, just saying, please cancel my unsubsidized loan. Um, and if you get to a point in the quarter for anybody else out there, uh, like it, your unsubsidized loan has paid out at some point in the quarter, you do have a, a way to request um, that get reversed if you repay it. Uh, so there is an option for that too. If you ever get into that situation where you said, ah, I forgot to cancel it and you know let it go out, um, usually within that quarter, we can help you along with our friends in the SBO to work through that process of repaying that loan essentially within the quarter without having it go to a loan servicer. So yes, you absolutely can cancel it at this point. Just let us know. Okay, perfect. And this might be repetitive. This is sort of linked though. Um, you know, the financial aid can either be accepted, denied, can, is sitting there. Can you explain the difference between um, things that are automatically maybe accepted because there's some aid types that you, you don't have to do anything and then some you do have to make a decision on? Yeah, great point. So uh, we talked in the financial aid offer, if you receive a grant that's granted to you, you don't have to do anything in order to activate or accept that grant, we're, we're providing it to you. Similarly, with most scholarships, you don't have to do anything to, you know, accept as, uh, or actively <laughs> do anything. There are some scholarships where you're required to go in and complete an acceptance process or a thank you letter. Um, so that's, I'm going to kind of go in tiers. Grants, easy peasy, don't have to do anything. Scholarships, if they come from Western, uh, you'll be notified if you have to do anything to accept um, or write a thank you letter. And if you haven't been notified, that means you probably don't have to do that. Again, you can check your, your email and any outstanding requirements of web for you there. And then uh, with the loans, I think that is the, the loans are the ones that require the most effort, right? Uh, we, we don't want to accept them on your behalf. Um, that would be not helpful and also against the law. So we won't do that. <laughs> we will let you accept those loans as you need to. Um, in order for those loans to pay out, so say you did accept your unsubsidized loan offer, you definitely want it. You do need to complete two pieces out at studentaid.gov in order for those uh, loans to actually disperse to your student account. Again, this will show up to you in web for you um, that you need to, to do these eventually if you accept your loan. 
but that would be the entrance counseling and a master promissory note. Those are two things that need to be completed. Now, if you put this out on uh, web for you, it says you need to do this, you need to go to direct loan entrance counseling and a master promissory note. Students are really, really great about remembering the entrance counseling and the sometimes that little master promissory note gets left behind. So those are the two pieces that um, need to be completed if you want your federal direct loan to actually pay out to your student account. And again, it goes back to checking your web for you and just making sure all of those um, you got all your ducks in a row. Everything is lined up prior to that first Friday of the quarter, if you would like some timely financial aid disbursement. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to go over to housing. There's a question about meal plans, and then Michelle may have additional information once she answers this question. But one of the questions is, when can you select a meal plan? We did not have that option in our room selection. Um, sure. So, um, a lot of students um, were doing a room selection and um, we were hearing that there actually wasn't a place to actually choose your meal plan. So um, at the end of um, August, um, Occupancy will be uh, putting a 125 meal plan on all students accounts that did not choose one in um, roommate selection. I'm not sure um, where that may have been missed, but you can definitely go in and change that to the proper meal plan that you would like to be on um, by um, that opens back up in your housing portal um, on September 4th. So you would just go in there, log in, uh, make sure you change your meal plan, and that definitely will get changed to the proper plan and the billing will get addressed um, before um, the quarter starts in fall. Um, I did put in um, on our chat um, some prices for our on-campus meal plans for fall. Um, just so you're aware, just kind of a tidbit on meal plans, because I saw another question. Um, all the meal plans um, come with a certain amount of dining dollars. Um, every quarter and you can use those outside of the meal plan that you select. So we have basically um, a few different meal plans. The unlimited means you can go in and use that unlimited meal plan daily for breakfast, lunch, um, you know, dinner, any of those throughout the day um, for that select price. And the 125, the 100 and the 80 um, for our on-campus um, students, um, those being that that's 80 meals or 100 meals or 125 meals. So if we have, say we're having 85 days in the quarter for fall and you're picking an 80 meal plan, you would probably understand that you'd probably be short about five meals um, for that quarter. So you can um, use your dining dollars in the commons also um, to supplement for a meal. Um, you can also um, add Viking dollars and that's something else that you can do um, and go in. Um, we are changing hands on our dining. Um, so at the end of August, um, we should have an up, updated website um, for you for regarding any kind of information for adding Viking dollars. That's something outside of your meal plan that gives you 10% off and tax when you go use that in the commons or at any of the eateries that we have on campus. Um, back to you, Dina. Thank you. I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to add really quick. There was a question about what's the best meal plan we're looking at the, for the best deal money-wise. Mm -hmm. I am open to buying cooking my own food. So okay. somebody like trying to save some money. Sure. So it depends on where you're living. So it depends if you have, if you're living in a resident hall that may have a, um, where you can cook. So if you're, um, in BT, we offer a meal plan for BT students because most of them have kitchens. Um, so they can have more dining dollars to spend versus, um, and so they can cook for themselves. So it depends a lot of students who would rather cook for themselves um, will more than likely put themselves on that 80 meal plan because it is a requirement for on-campus students to have a meal plan. Right, thank you. Um, I think this is business office, this, this is uh, probably your realm. Um, and it's just speaking to this again, I wanna make sure the families really understand. So the timing of financial aid and then having to pay that balance and sort of first day of class and late fees. And can you just go over that one more time to really help people understand? Absolutely, yes. So <clears throat> that financial aid disbursement was generally the Friday before classes start. So September 22nd for fall. Um, and then classes is that when that following Wednesday. So September 27th, that's when your tuition is due. 
However, you have a grace period before any sort of late fee would be assessed, and that would be until October 15th. So what I kind of like to recommend the sweet spot there is going to be your October 1st statement. Your October 1st statement is going to include all of your tuition charges that have gone onto your account from registering for fall. It's also going to include your financial aid disbursement, and it's also going to include any housing or tuition charges. So if you wait to get that October 1st statement, you still have time to make a payment before a late fee as long as you're paying, um, not sending us a paper check. That's or get funds gets a little dicey. You might want to, uh, we usually recommend allowing at least like 14 business days for get funds. Um, so that October 1st statement is going to be your most comprehensive statement of uh, your financial aid being dispersed, your charges being on your account, and still plenty of time to get a payment to us. Right. Thank you. So we have about five minutes left, so I'm going to try and speed us through a couple last questions here, but there's some important ones in here. Um, Potentially, Dong, my, this is, is related to sort of housing and security. Do you have any campus security escorts such as walking late at night from library to dorm? In short, yes, we do. Um, like I mentioned, public safety is 24-7. You can contact public safety for an escort. We do have several of those emergency call buttons around campus. Our campus also has an app called Live Safe where um, if you want, you can grant permission for public safety to also uh, watch your path with a, uh, using your smartphone on GPS to watch you move across campus as well, and you can contact them that way. Um, but yes, in short, we do. Thank you. Um, Molly, I, maybe you could even type this in, um, but where can I make an appointment to talk about FAFSA changes for more, possibly more financial aid? So kind of maybe either type in or at least uh, let people know sort of that process to, to go ahead and uh, meet with counselor. Yeah, uh, to keep it brief, I am just going to point this out and I can throw it in the chat after this, but uh, on your screen right now, you do see the financial aid uh, department contact information on your left. If you give us a call, we can set you up um, with either our, our front desk will answer or uh, to the best of their ability, or if needed, you can set an appointment with a financial aid counselor to discuss changes. Um, and you may also uh, self-schedule with uh, a financial aid counselor via our website, and that link is on our website as well. Thank you. Um, there, this is a question for you too, Molly. Um, if we applied for a parent plus loan back in late July, when will Western notify me if it's approved? So I think they're believing that Western will be contacting them about that approval. Could you? Okay. Maybe? Yeah, I could speak to that. So um, during the application, if you did a parent plus loan out at studentaid.gov and did the application, if um, you would have been notified at that time whether or not the Department of Education approved the loan that you passed the credit check. Um, essentially, if you did pass that credit check and uh, that has been, um, it, that information will be coming to us over the next couple of weeks and we'll start to create those loans um, and you will see uh, a parent plus loan in your student's financial aid offer uh, after that loan has been created. And again, that's going to be in web for you. The student will get an email that their financial aid has been revised and it will include a parent plus loan um, in there. So really at this point, um, if you've applied and been approved, that approval is done through the Department of Education. And then that information will get sent to us as we create loans for this upcoming year. Thank you. Housing, Dong, uh, my daughter has been assigned temporary housing. When will she get an assigned permanent housing? Yeah, I understand that can be a very uh, stressful situation. Um, it's a little hard to know. We tried, we will prioritize those students um, first for uh, rehousing. It can happen at any point. It can happen now, tomorrow. It can happen the first week of school. And sometimes it can be a little bit longer. Uh, what we don't want to be hasty on is um, the is uh, assigning somebody who's not a good match. Um, for example, smoking, non-smoking, pet pet allergy. So it's really difficult to know, but I, I would uh, just advise you to be patient. Um, temporary uh, assignments are always with our resident advisors who are great people. So I have no doubt you will have uh, a great roommate there, um, but it can be stressful when you're not sure exactly when you'll get your permanent housing uh, assignment. Thank you for recognizing that. I'm going to ask a quick question. Um, if your student, student's doing a WOOT program before school, can they move in before the program? The answer is yes. Um, 
The date is September 17th, that Sunday, I believe. Um, if you have more specific questions, all of that is coordinated by the WOOT program. So I recommend um, contacting the WOOT program to know exactly when is move in so that you don't miss the excursions and things like that. Great. And it looks like our last question, it looks like it's going to get a typed answer. So I think we have actually answered all of the questions either live uh, verbally, so you could hear the answer, or in the Q&A. So I'm going to throw it back to Vale to end this session. Wow. That has got to be a record that we have madly answered every question in there. Um, so thank you so much, all of you, for joining us and asking great questions, because even if you think you're the only one, I guarantee probably everyone else needed to hear the answer too. <laughs> and they're really happy that you asked it. So uh, we, like I said, we are recording this session. We will be posting the recording on our various websites. Um, please, you can see our contact information right up on the screen. Please do not hesitate to reach out to us in whatever manner feels easiest for you. We are open all summer long. As you can imagine, as we get closer to the school year, things will get busier. So now is a really great time to uh, give us a call. Call with your student. Um, that's a really great way. If you don't have that information release on file, have them listen to the questions you're asking. We want to get them engaged too. We know you're helping them, but it's a great time um, to have those questions answered. And if you're in Bellingham, hop in. We're here. Um, or if you feel like you need more time, we have appointments available as well. So we would love to talk with you and make sure when you set foot on campus, you're not feeling stressed out. Start the school year, you're ready and excited. So we are really happy to have you here tonight and see you in the fall. Please do not hesitate to reach out and we hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vale. Thank you.